Good evening, good evening ladies and gentlemen, dear students, welcome to today's event organized by the Department of Economics and special welcome to our president, the president from, of the University of Zurich, uh, welcome to the me members of the board of the University Council, members of the Cantonal Council and also members of the executive board of the University of Zurich. I don't know how to get off the music. <laughs> no. So, <laughs> okay, this was too much cognitive load. <laughs> anyway, so it's an honor for me uh, to welcome Professor Robert Harris Frank from Cornell University here in Zurich. Uh, Bob is very well known, at least at the University of Zurich, but as the audience here shows, not just at the university, so he apparently attracts a lot of people here who are interested in his topic. And for years now, he has encouraged his students to see beyond the linguistic boundaries of the word economics, which explains some of, as he says, and I agree, life's most intriguing puzzles. Uh, when you read Bob's book, then you often have the feeling he's not an economist, but in fact he is. Uh, he's taking up topics that are very unusual for economists, and he's, but he's bringing the economic way of thinking to these topics and explains it in a clarity uh, that is, in my view, pretty unique. For example, he, he's also willing to, to, to explain everyday stuff, so to speak, with economic logic, for example, why brown eggs cost more than white eggs, although they taste exactly the same than uh, the white eggs, uh, but also many other interesting topics. Now, today he will talk about a topic that interests us all, which is about efficiency, morality, and freedom. And uh, there are many intriguing questions associated with this topic. For example, to what extent is there a tension between the efficiency of a social outcome and people's freedom to pursue their goals. Or another important question is, is, is efficiency alone really a desirable social objective or do we need to complement it with other social goals such as justice or fairness? Or when efficiency and justice are in conflict with each other, which principle should we follow, the efficiency principle or the justice principle? Or another question he may touch on this evening is, uh, when we look at rising inequality, in particular in the U.S., uh, is this large inequality really the price we have to pay for an efficient society? Or can we put forward other arguments? Uh, these are deep questions that interest us a lot, and uh, 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 we are eager to hear what you have to say. Now, before I introduce him personally, let me say that the front... His speech will be filmed, so, and so those people who don't want to be on the movie, they have to sit outside, okay? <laughs> I mean, on the, on the, on the side, okay? Uh, just, that I have, <laughs> just that I have said it so that you are not surprised when you see yourself uh, at YouTube. Uh, anyway, uh, Professor Frank, uh, Bob is a professor of management and a professor of economics at the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell University. And apart from being a regular monthly contributor to the economic view at the New York Times, I really encourage you to read his, what he has to say there. I, I, I like it a lot to read them. Uh, he has also written numerous articles uh, in the best scholarly journals and also as well as in leading opinion magazines. And among other things, Bob is the author of several best-selling books. And for example, the number one Sunday Times bestseller, The Economic Naturalist, Why Economics Explains Almost Everything. And in this book, he tackles questions like, <clears throat> why do female models earn so much more than male models? 
you wouldn't think that an economist has much to say on that. <laughs> or why are child safety seats required in cars but not in aeroplanes? Think about it. I mean, isn't it a puzzle? Uh, and, or why are whales but not chicken in danger of extinction? Uh, you, this may not, I mean, actually, this is an important question because uh, uh, that, that some, some of our species are close to extinction and many people care about that, while others are not. Uh, but he has also uh, written books uh, that uh, really shaped, for example, my view of the world to some extent. For example, in his book, Choosing the Right Pond, The Human Quest for Status, he derives enormous policy implication from one very simple idea, a human fact, and maybe you will go into this in your speech, that is that we care about our social status. There are very surprising implications from that simple assumption that we care about our social status, and he, will, he wrote the whole book on this, and it was an eye-opening book, for example, for me. Or he wrote a book called Passion Within Reason, uh, where he describes how human beings deviate from the traditional homo economicus assumption and why evolution has shaped us this way. So he is indeed really broad and deep, and that's why he also got many awards and, and had, has many achievements. Uh, beyond the fact that he's an international well-known economist uh, who studies, the co among other things, the causes and consequences of social inequality, he has also been a Peace Corps volunteer in rural Nepal, Nepal or the chief economist of the Civil Aeronautics Board. Uh, and during 1992-93, you were a fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies of the Behavior, in the Behavioral Sciences. And around the turn of the century, you were a professor for American Civilization at the École des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. In Paris. And his influential book, The Darwin Economy, Liberty, Competition, and the Common Good, was awarded the 2012 Bronze Medal Book Award in the economics category. So given all these achievements and awards, and given these interesting books, we are all eager to hear what you have to say to the topic of today. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I give you Professor Robert Frank. Yeah, let me start by thanking Ernst for that uh, overly generous introduction. Uh, I'm always glad to see him and, and have a chance to chat with him and, and look forward to more of that this evening. Uh, thanks, too, to Philip uh, and the collaboration of all the supporters of, of your center. I know you've achieved great things, things I wouldn't have imagined possible without a tradition of that sort of thing longstanding. So, and, and thanks all, also to Eileen Zumstein. Uh, the, the crowd here tonight, I think, is in large measure a consequence of her uh, very skillful efforts at making the events occurrence known to, to many people. Uh, and for a speaker, uh, that, that's just incredibly important, uh, not only that some people attend the event, but that it not be scheduled in a room that's way too big for the number of people who come. I, I, one of my least favorite memories going back over many years is having been invited to a school to speak in Virginia. And uh, I think they made no effort to publicize it. They, they booked the event in an auditorium with a thousand people, a uh, thousand seats, and there were about 40 people in the audience. So <laughs> there was someone here, someone there, a few down in front. And you just have to stand there and give your talk, but it's, it's just not fun to do that. And I appreciate, I appreciate the fact that you raised such a nice audience for the event tonight. Uh, let me also uh, mention that I'm working on a book called Success and Luck. Its thesis is, roughly speaking, that chance events figure in life far more prominently than most of us recognize. Uh, it won't be out for a while, but uh, I regard the fact that I get to participate in an event like this as just an extraordinary stroke of good fortune. My friend George Ainsley, a psychologist, uh, told me once that the most scarce resource uh, going forward will be the willingness of other people to pay attention to you. They've got their iPhones, they've got their iPads, they've got their 
Angry Birds, their Twitter feeds, you know, there's just so much stuff sucking up attention that who's going to listen to us in, in the next years? And to have so many people, most of whom have something else useful they could have done this evening, come out and give up whatever you could have done to sit here and listen to me talk, I'm fully cognizant of the fact that I'm extraordinarily lucky to be in a, a position to, to get to speak to you. <clears throat> the thesis I'm going to try to defend uh, starts uh, from the standard economist view of morality. Uh, economists have been interested in morality since uh, the beginning. Adam Smith was a moral philosopher. Uh, Hume was a moral philosopher. The, the, the tradition comes from moral philosophy. And uh, they didn't have these terms then, but uh, they, these men were not, and they were mostly men, were not deontologists. They weren't people who thought you had to follow some arbitrary set of rules handed down from who knows where. They were people who believed that the best outcome is the one that leads to the best overall consequences. And that doesn't sound controversial, but the deontologists get red in the face when they hear somebody try to defend that that claim. Uh, still, I think it's a defensible claim, uh, and many interesting ideas flow from it in any event. So if you don't like consequentialism, uh, I'll ask you to park your objections at the door momentarily and just listen to, to, to what the arguments uh, are that emerge from consequentialist thinking. Uh, my, my claim they'll try to defend is that in order for an action to be moral, and let me qualify that by saying that I'm not talking about major life-changing actions, I'm talking about small bore actions, ones whose consequences don't amount to more than a small fraction of your lifetime income, if we were trying to put a dollar figure on them. That for uh, ordinary actions, everyday actions, in order to be a moral action, it must also be an efficient action in the economist narrow sense. There's not a conflict between efficiency and morality uh, on this way of looking at things. It's just that unless you're efficient, you can't possibly doing, be doing the most moral choice of those that are available to you. I'm going to define efficiently presently, but uh, it's, it's a standard uh, cost-benefit uh, calculus of the sort you see in, in journal articles all the time. Uh, it's not uh, uh, universally popular, but I think it's, it's, it's better than many of its critics believe. So the whole idea revolves around the concept, concept of economic surplus. Here's a watch. Uh, suppose I own this watch and value it at $100. How much surplus is there in the system uh, on account of the existence of this watch, well, I value it at $100, that's $100 worth of surplus. Uh, if you said, I have to buy the watch first, I'd deduct the price of it and say there's the difference is surplus. Now you come along and you value the watch at $200. If I sell it to you for $180, I, I thought about converting all these numbers into francs, but then Roberto told me the franc and the dollar were about the same, so I didn't bother to do that. Uh, so, so if you want to think francs, that's, that's fine. That's the same, uh, apparently. So I sell it to you for $180. You valued it at $200. You've gained $80 worth of surplus that you didn't have before. Uh, I got $180 for, uh, excuse me, you, you, I sell it to you for $180. You valued it at $200. You've gained $20 worth of surplus that you didn't have before. I valued the watch at $100, I sold it to you for $180, and now I'm $80 uh, more surplus than before. Total surplus, $200, uh, but unless the watch ends up in the hands of the person that values it most highly, we haven't maximized the total possible surplus. That's just uh, a simple starting point for the discussion. So what is economic efficiency as I'm using the term? It just means maximum economic surplus. That's all it means. You have to understand that when we're talking about the things that get counted up in surplus, it includes everything. So the pretty sunset I saw from my hotel window last night, that's the, the value I assign to that is economic surplus. The joy I take from hearing a poem, that counts too. The, the, the pain I experience when I get in an argument for a loved one, that reduces economic surplus. So it's not just the bean counters adding up the prices times the quantities, it's everything we care about. So don't, don't retreat from the idea of efficiency because you have a preconception that it's some narrow uh, thing that doesn't apply to what, what really matters. No, it, it applies to everything. 
And again, the claims I'll make is that uh, if an action is moral, it's got to be efficient in the first instance. And if we say an action is freedom enhancing, it's got to be efficient. Uh, if, and the way, the way I'll argue for those claims is that if it weren't efficient, you could always come up with an alternative arrangement that would make people uh, better able to achieve their life objectives, whatever those might be, each and every person, and also would enable people to have more options than he or she currently has. And that's the sense in which I'm using the term freedom. Freedom doesn't mean not having any restrictions. Uh, even the staunchest libertarian, most of them, they, they get up and they go to work for somebody every day. And so somebody can boss them around. Don't they care about freedom? No, they care about freedom, but they also care about paying their rent and buying food. And uh, if you can get more income by giving up some of your ability to control what you do during the day, you haven't given up freedom on balance. You've purchased a freedom that's more valuable to you than the freedom that you gave up. So these are, are fairly general terms. I don't think I'm using them in a way that any of you should find controversial. So, so I hope we can proceed on that basis. Uh, I, I show this diagram to my students probably a hundred times, no matter what the course is that I'm teaching during the semester. So uh, there's situation A on the left. That's inefficient. The size of the pie, as measured by its diameter, is total economic surplus. Uh, maybe the area of the pie would be a more precise way to say it. And it doesn't matter who gets which part of the pie, let's say there's somebody who gets the, the blue slice and somebody gets the, the pink slice, if the pie isn't efficient, if you haven't uh, maximized economic surplus, that means just by definition, no, no hocus pocus, that means you could make the pie bigger. So you could move from situation A to situation B. That's just a definition of efficiency. The things we care about the benefits minus the costs in situation A add up to a bigger number than the things we, we care about, benefits minus costs in situation A. And here's a, a theorem, I guess you could call it, although it probably doesn't deserve to be dignified with any, any fancy name. If the pie gets bigger, it must be possible for each and every person to get a bigger slice than before. Does anybody want to say, no, that doesn't make sense? Uh, you'd, you'd be embarrassed to try to defend the, the, the converse uh, popul proposition to that. Just keep the angles the same, and the, the slices will be bigger for everybody if you make the pie bigger. Okay, that's, in a nutshell, the argument I'm going to try to develop for you tonight. The, the first time I thought seriously about this argument was when I was, uh, Ernst mentioned I was the chief economist at the Civil Aeronautics Board in Washington. That's the now defunct agency that used to regulate the airlines. Uh, we were in the process then of setting them free. They could serve any city they want, charge whatever they want. It's worked out in a kind of a mixed way. Not everybody's happy about the, the new air system, but if you're poor, probably you like the new air system. You can fly now instead of uh, taking a bus uh, at, at roughly the same cost, controlling for the price, controlling for the cost. So what, what they traditionally did at that time was if there were an overbooked flight, uh, and everybody's uh, in favor of the logic of letting airlines overbook, because if they can't overbook, the, the people don't show up for the flight, and then the flight goes out with a lot of empty seats, they can keep fares lower on average by overbooking. So, so we let them overbook, but then inevitably, uh, you can't predict exactly how many tickets it's safe to sell. More people show up than there are seats on the plane. And at that time, the procedure for dealing with that was first come, first served. Uh, maybe that was the situation tonight. Uh, the, there were people who didn't get into the hall because they didn't get here uh, early enough. That's inefficient. It would be better to use some mechanism that allows people to signal how important it is for them to, to get on. So here we have a flight, 260 people show up, 250 seats. I'll focus on two passengers. John, he's the second guy to show up. Uh, he's, he's, he's safe, he's gonna get to keep his seat. He's an office custodian, and he's on his way to visit his mother in Los, in Los Angeles. He's gonna have to wait 10 hours if he gives up his seat and has to go on the next available flight to get there. He's willing to pay $200 to avoid missing the flight. And I want you to understand that as, for him, a very big number. 
He doesn't have very much money. He would give up $200 in cash if they offered it to him uh, rather than give up his seat. Here's the 255th passenger to show up. I got this off of a Swiss website. I hope it's not somebody you know. Um, <laughs> I, w I was looking for a man who didn't look poor, uh, basically. He, he arrived late, not because he didn't care about keeping his seat. He just had a bad connection that was late coming into the airport. And he's a Microsoft vice president. He can re reach his vacation destination in Hawaii via Seattle, uh, rather than LA, with only one hour's delay in getting to Hawaii. He's willing to pay $1,000 to avoid missing the current flight. So the question is, who should miss the flight? I, I tried to cook up the details of the example so that if you had a pulse, a, a beating heart, you would say, well, the hell with the Microsoft vice president. He's only going to be an hour late. Let the custodian go. His mother might die. But that's the wrong answer. <laughs> Why is it the wrong answer? Because if we let the Microsoft vi vice president go, the pie will be $800 bigger than if we let the other guy go. So let's just suppose that the CAB is successful in implementing its proposed change to the first come, first serve system, which was require the airlines to conduct a volunteer auction whenever the flight is overbooked. So we'll give you $400 if you will give up your seat. You don't have to give up your seat. It's purely volunteer. So when you do a regulation change like that, you have to publish uh, a, an announcement in the Federal Register that allows interested parties to comment whether they think it's a good idea. And almost before the ink was dry on the announcement we posted uh, saying what we were planning to do, we got an angry brief filed by the Aviation Consumer Action Project. This is a consumer protection group, it views itself. Its mission is to protect the hapless air traveler from being screwed by greedy capitalist big airlines. And so, Ralph Nader was the founder of this group. Their objection, in essence, was, here we'll have yet another domain where the poor people have the hard lifting to do and the rich get to go merrily on their way. And some people on the Civil Aeronautics Board said, yeah, we shouldn't do this. And I said, wait a minute, think about what you're saying. Imagine that we approve this regulation and they're conducting the auction. We'll give 300, if we get enough volunteers, 350, blah, blah, blah. Then they get up to 400 and finally they get enough volunteers. So John, who was willing to give up his seat for $200, now gets a payment of $400 for agreeing to wait for the next available flight. And up comes Ralph Nader, waving a court injunction, and says, stop this process. You're depriving the poor of, of the, the, the right to be treated on equal terms with the rich. And, and John asks, plausibly, how are you helping me here exactly? I volunteered to give up my seat for a payment of $400. I, I would have been willing to give it up for a payment of $201. I'm going to get 200 bucks beyond my reservation price for giving up the seat. I got many pressing needs to attend to. One of them is to see my mother before she dies, but I've also got kids so I can't afford braces for my daughter. I've got all sorts of other things that I'm worried about. Probably my mother's gonna hang on for another few days. I'm willing, <laughs> I'm willing to take a risk in order to get that money. So would it be the right position for a government agency to say, we need to protect this man from making a decision he'll regret forever. He's too stupid to sort this out on his own. He'll take the money and go buy fire water and, and come to ruin. If it were a life-threatening condition for him, <coughs> maybe we would say that. No, you can't work in the radiation spill. But if it's just being late for a plane, let him decide to do that on his own. And Probably, you'll get a few bad choices, but on balance, it'll be a better world if people can give up a seat that they value at 200 so that somebody who values the seat at 1,000 can get to use it. 
not just because the guy who values it at 1,000 is happier, that's true, but also because the other guy who volunteered to get off the flight is happier. There aren't any losers here. If you don't do this efficiently, you are failing to create opportunities to pursue their life goals to the maximum degree possible. Why would you want to do that? What's the defense of doing that? I want to hear, send me an email if you have a defense of doing that. I know <clears throat> Ernst has used my textbook. I also have an introductory textbook that I co-wrote with Ben Bernanke. We've done a lot of research on the introductory course. The short summary of it is no one learns anything in it. <laughs> there are hundreds of thousands of hours spent on it, and, and yet when we give students tests that probe their knowledge of basic economic principles six months after they took an introductory course, they don't score any better than people who never took the course at all. <laughs> it's it, It's... It, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Uh, and I think the main reason for this is that we think we need to show them everything. We throw hundreds of ideas at them every hour, and uh, by the end of the term, they've seen thousands of ideas. It's just too much to sort out. The brain has a built-in algorithm. If you don't hear it multiple times, don't pay any attention to it. That's a sanity-preserving step. There are terabytes of information that bombard you every day. Most of them aren't relevant. And when you start to hear something two or three times, uh, then you say, ah, oh, maybe this is important for me. You start to lay down brain circuits for dealing with that in a more efficient way. So if you want people to learn anything, we argued, the, the central starting point is to pick the six ideas you think are most important and then do them over and over again. That's a strategy I've begun to carry over into all forms of communication that I get involved in. So when I show you other examples that seem sort of like the first example you saw, don't think uh, that I'm assuming you're stupid. I'm not assuming that at all. I'm assuming that unless you see the same thing happen two or three different ways, it won't sink in in any meaningful way. So, so indulge me. Here's another example. We've got a philanthropic antique dealer. Uh, he, he cares about promoting the social good. He's not a profit maximizer. He just wants, wants to do good. There are such people in business, and some of them do actually pretty well, despite not seeking to make a lot of money. So he's got a 1905 Stickley grandfather clock in his show, showroom window, uh, and there are two people who want the clock. And the question is going to be, which one should get the clock? Uh, and I've cooked the example so that uh, the, there's an obvious candidate that uh, many of us will favor. Susan, she grew up in a household where her parents collected early 20th century furniture. She goes to seminars. She goes to auctions. She's got her own nascent collection of this kind of furniture. And she would love to own this clock. There is no question about her enthusiasm level for owning this clock. But she's a single mother of two small children. She's a school teacher. She earns $28,000 a year. Listen to what she's willing to pay. Despite having such a low income, she's willing to pay $5,000 to own this clock. She really wants this clock, is what that means. <laughs> Here, here's Malcolm. He's a personal injury lawyer. No offense to personal injury lawyers in the room. Uh, he has no particular interest in clocks from that era or any other era. Uh, but he was walking by and saw this one in the window and thought, hey, that would look good in my waiting room. <laughs> He's willing to pay $10,000 for the clock. He earns $950,000 a year. That's why he's willing to pay $10,000 for this clock. Not because he likes it. It's just that that's what he's willing to pay for it. So just to be clear, if we're just talking about the enjoyment, the psychological pleasure that the clock will convey, Susan's up near maximum on the utility meter. We plug her in, uh, think about, we put her in the magnet, uh, and think about owning this clock. Boing, goes the, the meter off the, off the top of the chart. Put Malcolm in, eh, clock, schmuck, you know, I, I'd like to have it. So, who should own the clock? Uh, 
You, you got to want Susan to own the clock, it feels like to me. I, I tried to make you want Susan to own the clock, but she shouldn't own the clock. Here's the attraction of willingness to pay. Yes, of course, Susan would enjoy the clock more than Malcolm. That's the built-in uh, foundation of the example. But, and I put this in caps because this is the key point, she has relatively low income. That means she also cares more than Malcolm does about everything else that you might be able to buy with a dollar. He's already met all of his urgent needs. He doesn't need anything else. So 5000 for a clock, what's the difference? You know, just some charity will get less money when he dies. Uh, it's not an important sacrifice for him to, to pay that much for a clock. She pays 5000 for a clock. Uh, you know, we're talking a, a huge sacrifice for her. She'll have to give up a whole lot. So if she were given the clock, based on her own assessment of its value to her, namely $5,000, the best thing for her to do would be to sell it to Malcolm for some price between $5,000 and $8,000. The surplus would go up if she did that. No, she wouldn't get to own the clock that she would really love to own. No, but she would get $8,000, and $8,000 buys lots of really important stuff for her. Just as 400 bought lots of really important stuff for the guy who volunteered to give up his seat on the plane. It's the same example. Who should get the clock? Malcolm should get the clock, even though he doesn't care about the clock. Many presidential orders in the U.S. have urged uh, department heads to do weighted cost-benefit analysis. The, the objection to cost-benefit analysis it gives too much weight to people who have a lot of money. People like Malcolm, for whom a dollar doesn't count. So, of course, their benefits are going to be inflated when you do a cost-benefit analysis. So it says, try to, try to correct for that by knocking down the values of those people. If you do that, you get a smaller surplus. You get a smaller surplus, full stop. If you used unweighted willingness to pay, you'd get a bigger surplus. It doesn't mean that if you did the project, everybody would be better off. You might have to take some special steps to make sure that the bigger pie got distributed in such a way that everybody would be better off. But the geometry of the matter is not in doubt. You can cut the bigger pie up in a way so that everybody could get a bigger pie. Suppose the people who think you ought to use weighted willingness to pay have the power to block the use of unweighted willingness to pay, the real cost-benefit analysis. Well, then they should use that power to bargain for a big transfer payment. If you give us some money, we'll let you use unweighted willingness to pay. The pie will be bigger, and the transfer payment you could give us would be bigger than the one we would get, uh, what we, the slice we would get if we stuck with the status quo. You can think about this as an opportunity. If you use unweighted willingness to pay, that makes the pie bigger. You might be a winner in some cases, a loser in other cases, but if your preferences are unsystematic, if they're not correlated, particularly with your income, then uh, you, you would come out on balance ahead. Suppose I offered you a chance to flip a coin or roll dice, and if you, if you, uh, uh, if you got heads when you flipped a coin, you'd get $1,000. If you got tails when you flipped a coin, you'd lose $100. Would you take that gamble? I would. Most people would. Uh, unless your religion pro prohibits gambling, you, you should take that gamble. If I offered you that gamble a thousand times, you'd be stark raving mad not to take it. Why? Because, sure, you could lose if you took one flip of the coin and got tailed, oh, I lost $100, I was stupid. Well, you weren't stupid, you did the right thing, you just were unlucky. If you flip it a thousand times, you're not gonna come out behind uh, with, with any but the remotest uh, level of probability. You're gonna be a big winner if you take that gamble. So using cost benefit with uh, analysis with unweighted willingness to pay is taking a chance to make the pie bigger a thousand different ways we have policy decisions involving these kinds of issues and you're going to come out ahead if you do that compared to if you use any other decision metric. Again, having more surplus just means by definition being able to do more of what you want to do. So that's uh, more or less my case for efficiency. Uh, if you don't like my case for efficiency, you won't like my case for freedom either, probably. But I'm going to tr try to develop that uh, at this point. So uh, again, I'll use a simple example. I've got Ted and Bill. They're thinking of living together and sharing a two-bedroom apartment, which they can rent for $500 a month. 
That's one option. There are compromises when you live with someone else, or there can be. And so each is considering also the option of living alone in a one-bedroom apartment. To rent that would cost 300 a month. So again, 500 a month for two of you, or 300 a month each, you're going to be paying in total 100 a month more if you live separately than if you live together. Simple example, and this, you know, almost every one of my MBA students confronted exactly this choice when uh, they got to Ithaca in September. How much privacy am I willing to give up for a savings and rent? All right, so in this particular example, I want to examine the structure of who has the right to do what. That's the, the purpose of this example here. So here's the problem. If the rent were the same uh, uh, either way, they wouldn't care whether they shared living space. They, it's a little extra company, that's nice. Maybe a little less privacy, that's not so nice. That's a wash. The one problem that makes it not a wash is that Ted likes to practice his trumpet late at night. And Bill likes to go to sleep early, and so that disturbs his sleep. That's a problem. Is it an insurmountable one? It depends on how seriously they're invested in what they want. Ted would be willing to pay up to $150 a month rather than giving up his, his uh, trumpet playing right uh, late at night. It's important to him as measured uh, in this instance by what he's willing to pay. Maybe he's the son of a rich family. Maybe that's why he's willing to pay so much. It doesn't matter. Bill would be willing to pay 80 a month not to have his sleep disturbed. He cares too, but he's not willing to pay as much. All right, first question, just a, a, a descriptive question. Will they live together? Hmm. Most of my students, when they see a question like this for the first time, say, no, no, it wouldn't pay for them to live together. Why do they say no? They say if they live together, well, the rent would be 250 each, and Bill is going to suffer uh, $80 a month of, of nuisance from listening to the trumpet, and that puts him at a higher rent than he would if he'd lived on his own for, for 300 a month in a one-bedroom apartment. But that's not the right way to think about it. Think about the relevant economic surplus total. So what's the benefit of living together, and what's the cost of living together? The benefit of living together is very simple to calculate here. It's the $100 a month that you save in rent. Does anybody think it's a different number? There isn't any other number you can find that would answer that question. At least not one that I can think of. What's the least costly accommodation to the trumpet problem? We have two ways we might solve it if we wanted to solve it. Bill could either put up with it, that's the solution, or we could say to Ted, stop playing the trumpet at night. Those are the only two solutions if they live together. They've got to pick one of them. So, look, the cost to Ted of stopping playing is 150. Why impose a loss of 150 on him rather than a loss of 80 on Bill? Just say, suck it up, Bill. Listen to the, the, the trumpet late at night. It's going to cost you 80. Well, I'm not willing to do it then. Wait a minute. There's some surplus to be gained here. Can't we cut the pie up in a way that would make everyone better off? It's got to be possible. We know, we know because there is an additional $20 a month in surplus generated if they live together. They save 100 in rent. That's not the gain in surplus. But they have a problem, which is Bill's got to listen to the trumpet, but that problem costs only 80. So the surplus gain, 20. So let's share that surplus equally among them by charging each of them rent that's $10 less than the maximum they'd be willing to pay to enter this arrangement, and that means Ted pays $290. His alt he doesn't give anything up by moving in with Bill. He gets to play his trumpet late at night. What's the sacrifice? There was no other problem. He's paying $290. He would have had to pay $300, so he's better off by $10. Bill, he's going to pay $210. 90 bucks off the rent that he would pay in the one-bedroom apartment, but he gets such a big reduction because he's got to listen to this damn trumpet at night. Uh, that's the compensation for him. So if you can negotiate and make transfers, uh, it's got to be that the best solution must be the efficient solution. How could it not be the efficient solution if you could make everybody better off by moving from inefficient to efficient? Now, you see very other, uh, very different uh, perspectives on rights in the philosophical 
literature. The very first sentence in Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia is, people have rights. Well, of course they have rights, but that's not interesting. Uh, what do they have the rights to do exactly? If Ted has the right to play the trumpet late at night, Bill doesn't have the right to go to bed early and go to sleep. So which right should we defend in a case like that? Uh, should you be free to yell fire in a crowded theater? You say to the judge, I get lots of utility from yelling fire in a crowded theater. We don't normally allow that because it's thought that the, the costs of defending the right to say fire in a crowded theater vastly outweigh any possible benefits that somebody would get from saying it. So the, the, the economist's perspective on rights and the one that I embrace com completely and wholeheartedly, I trace to Ronald Coase. Uh, 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 people who use the first edition of my textbook in, in microeconomics will remember that my chapter on Coase uh, began with a sentence something like, one of the biggest uh, injustices in economics has been the failure of the Nobel Prize Committee to give Ronald Coase the Nobel Prize. This was in 1990. In 1991, he got the Nobel Prize. But I, I was critical of the Nobel uh, Committee because they waited until Coase was 81 years old to give him the Nobel Prize. Uh, you don't get it after you die. There have been uh, lots of people who should have got it who didn't get it uh, because the committee didn't act in time. They also waited way too long for Tom Schelling, who got it in 2006. He was 85 or 86 by that time. Two people vastly more important as thinkers than many of the earlier recipients of the prize, if you let me offer my humble opinion on, on that question. So, so uh, I was delighted in the next edition to acknowledge that, yes, he had won the Nobel Prize. As it turned out, they would have had 23 more chances to give him the Nobel Prize. He lived to be 100 and, uh, almost 103 when he, he died uh, last year. He was 102 plus. So his, his point was that without transactions costs, parties will negotiate efficient solutions to externalities on their own. Uh, the, the conservatives love this. They thought it meant the government uh, has no business messing with us anymore. If there's an externality, we'll take care of it. We'll negotiate a solution to it. The main thrust of his work was very different from that. It was that often it's not practical to negotiate solutions. There are thousands of people involved in many externalities. How could I negotiate a carbon treaty with the people in this room, never mind all the people for whom it would be important to have one uh, as signatories uh, on, on on a treaty like that. So in those cases, uh, often government is the best vehicle to do what we can't do privately through negotiation on our own. And the deep insight from Coase, in my opinion, is that when we think about the law, we should think about uh, it being shaped to mimic the kinds of agreements that you and I would have reached if it had been practical for us to negotiate with one another. So do you have the right to block my view? In San Francisco, you can't negotiate about that. It's too complicated, too many, too many uh, uh, practical difficulties. Uh, and so the law writes, uh, has a lot of texture in it that says whether you can block someone's view. It's very strict in San Francisco, where the views are spectacular and really worth a lot to protect. In Kansas City, the law is pretty silent on whether you can block someone's view. Uh, take my view, please. Uh, it, it's, it's not something that's highly contentious uh, in, in Kansas City. So once you're armed with this view, you can sort of look at how the law evolves. It, it evolves, really, I think, once you start uh, framing it this way, in a way that moves gradually and imperfectly toward more efficient solutions of these externality-type problems. So here's John Stuart Mill. Uh, we, some, Sometimes it's, it's the best possible solution for the law to say you can't cause harm to others. The, the situation with the apartment was, uh, I, I designed that example as a microcosm of what we face as a, a society at large. Uh, we might not be able to negotiate uh, uh, individual solutions to a noise problem like that, and so we would have to say who on average can better adapt to the noise problem. Is it the listener? Can he put earplugs in? Or is it the guy who's making the noise? Maybe he could move somewhere else where the noise wouldn't bother anyone. And that's the way the noise laws do seem to be crafted. So uh, I, I always get a lot of pushback from my libertarian friends when I tell them I think of myself as a libertarian. 
And they say, how could somebody who favors such an expansive role for government as, as I do be a libertarian? And so here's, here's John Stuart Mill, the, the passage from On Liberty that I really resonated with when I read it in high school. The sole end for which mankind are warranted, individually or collectively, in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. That's the only purpose for which power can rightfully be exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will. That's to pre prevent him from harming others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not sufficient warrant. He cannot rightfully be compelled to do or forbear because it would be better for him to do so, because it will make him happier, or because in the opinion of others to do so would be wise or even right. The only part of, conduct, of the conduct of anyone for which he is amenable to society is that which concerns others. Uh, in the part which merely concerns himself, his independence is of right absolute. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. I totally buy that, that argument. There are interesting challenges to that argument, and I, I think interesting debates are possible about this conception, but I personally, I think most of us who are academics, we chose this room because, uh, as one of my friends who, who uh, was an academic, said, the best part of my job is that no one's the boss of me, and I, I'm not the boss of anyone else. Uh, that, that's, we don't want to be messed with. We don't want people telling us what, what we have to do or can't do. And so uh, I really like John Stuart Mill's proposal. I think it's possible, and here's the interesting claim to me, I think that uh, on any meaningful understanding of the term harm to others, the institutions and practices of the modern welfare state are not only consistent with Mill's harm principle, they're absolutely required by it. We have to regulate in many of the ways we do or else we would be permitting undue harm to others. Let me uh, give an example due to Tom Schelling that I think makes uh, the essence of the point that, that many people seem confused about in freedom arguments. So Schelling wanted to know, why do hockey players vote in secret ballots for helmet rules even though they choose not to wear helmets when there is no rule? So if helmets are so great, he asked, why don't you just wear a helmet? Why do you need a rule? And his answer was that by taking your helmet off, you get a competitive advantage. You can see better, you can hear better. And so if I take my helmet off, and my teammates do too, we're more likely to win the game. And uh, any competitive athlete will tell you that even a small increase in the probability of winning now trumps any concerns about what might happen down the road. But no one should think that if we take our helmets off, the other side's going to be unresponsive to that. They're going to take their helmets off too. And so the equilibrium in that case is everybody skates without a helmet. Again, we have a level playing field or level ice. And nobody gains a competitive advantage. Everybody is at more serious risk of head injury. But the only way you can get a different outcome is to have a rule requiring helmets. So think about what that does to the, the naive concept of freedom. Think of someone like Robert Nozick said, the helmet rule robs players of their liberty to choose for themselves whether to wear helmets. Of course it does that. That's the whole point of the helmet rule. They know that if they have the freedom to choose individually, they'll end up with wearing no helmets and they're more likely to get injured and they'll get nothing of, of a positive advantage in the process. So you can't just post a sign in the locker room saying caution, skating without a helmet could be dangerous. That won't have any effect. You got to require them to wear helmets. Now it's not a government in this case, so he would probably say, well, okay, I'll form my own league if I don't want to wear helmets. But there are some things that you can't do unless you have a government to do them. So uh, I think it's a very simple extension from this example to the, the question of safety regulation. Every society regulates safety. Milton Friedman and others, uh, George Stigler, complain bitterly that this robs individuals to strike whatever bargain they saw fit with their employers about how to trade off safety and wages. Uh, if the employer doesn't have to pay for safety devices in the workplace, he can pay me a higher wage. If I'm willing to take the risk, why should the government tell me, no, I can't do that? The employer's willing to do it, I'm willing to do it, who's harmed by that? And if the answer were that no one's harmed by that, I would say, have at it. You know, that's 
totally a, a, a compelling argument, but others are harmed when I take a riskier job at higher pay. Why do workers do that? Well, they, they want to buy additional things. One of the very most important things they want to buy, if they're young workers with, with kids, is they want to send their kids to a better school. Does anyone not know that a, a, the concept of a good school is a relative concept? It's a school that's better than the other schools. And no matter what happens, half the kids are going to go to bottom half schools. There's no way around that musical chairs constraint. So if I sell my safety and I get a higher wage and I use the money to bid for a house in a better school district, I put pressure on you to do likewise. And so you do it and others do it. And what do we succeed in doing in the end? We succeed in bidding up the prices of the houses in the best school districts. Still half our kids go to bottom half schools, the same as before. But can, can I individually uh, escape from the, the, the dilemma I face? There's no way I can make any other choice. I've got to accept the risk in order to send my kids to, to the best school I can. And so we regulate safety. We say, no, you can't take any more risks than a certain amount. We do it clumsily. We do it imperfectly. There are, there are better ways to do it than the ways we do do it. But I think if we don't understand why we do it and we keep arguing about whether we should do it, we won't make progress on that front. There, if, once you understand incentives, there are many, many better ways to regulate safety than the ones we use. But you've got to understand why we do it before you're steered to those solutions. Now, I, I promised Ernst I would say something about inequality, which has been a, a, a subject of great interest to me lately. Uh, the, the discussion that we've had about inequality in most uh, circles, in the, in the US in particular, has been couched mainly in moral terms. It's immoral that some have such vast excess while others don't even have the basics. Uh, it, it's unconscionable, the distribution of income. Very little progress gets made uh, in debates involving that language. Conservatives have a, their, their conception of fairness, liberals have theirs, and there, there doesn't seem to be much movement toward common ground in those discussions. I think it's much more productive to examine inequality with an eye toward what's its effect on the total economic surplus available for us to share. And the answer to that question is very simple and I think compelling. It's that inequality is woefully inefficient. It makes the surplus vastly smaller than it could be if we had less inequality. You obviously have to have some inequality. If everybody got paid the same, nobody would work. Uh, or maybe some would, but then you'd see others not working and getting the same as you. Why should I work if, uh, if they're not working? So things would, would slide off into a... So the, 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 the nature of the argument I want to give you uh, rests on a couple of simple propositions. I don't think you'll find a controversial one among them. If you do, send me an email or come up afterwards and explain to me what, what you spotted. So here, I'll begin with uh, this simple illustration of the importance of context. Which of the two vertical lines is longer? I'll ask you that question. Uh, you're all smart, I know, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, so what do you think? Which, which vertical line is longer? A lot of people say they're the same, and that's a pretty savvy strategic calculation. They don't look the same, but why would he ask if they were the same? Uh, so yeah, I'm going to say they're the same. Yeah, all right, you get points for thinking strategically, but how many of you think they look the same? Uh, if you think they look the same, then you should schedule a session with your neurologist. Uh, <laughs> there's something going awry in your brain. If you have a normal human brain, that line should look shorter than that line. It's it sits in a different context. The way the normal brain processes those, that one should look longer to you. Uh, and if it does look longer to you, you don't need to feel ashamed or apologize. Uh, you're normal. That's totally OK to feel that way. Context matters for everything. Are we almost there yet? Uh, it depends what fraction of the distance we got to cover uh, uh, the answer to that question. Is my house okay? I lived in a house like this in Nepal when I was a Peace Corps volunteer long ago. It had two rooms, it had no electricity, no plumbing. 
And when it rained hard the, in, at the beginning of the monsoon, the, the roof would leak a lot uh, before the, the straw swelled to, to keep the rain out. Uh, never for a moment did that house seem unsatisfactory to me when I was living in it for those two years. I used to have colleagues over frequently, uh, and, and it was fine as a place to live. It was a nicer house, I'm, I'm going to say, than three quarters of the houses that the other high school teachers at, at my school lived in. If I lived in a house like that in Ithaca, New York, uh, my kids wouldn't have wanted their friends to see where we lived. They would have been ashamed. Uh, and it's not because they're bad kids. They have good values, in my opinion. Uh, they, they got uh, uh, to be adults without getting corrupted by the material culture uh, that you, you see uh, corrupting some people. They have very good values, but they would have been ashamed. And I would be ashamed to to have somebody see that I lived in a house like that in Ithaca because that house is not okay in Ithaca. It, it's, a, it's a loud statement that you screwed up. You, know, you, didn't, you didn't do what normal people are expected to, to do in that context. There's my house in Ithaca, New York. Uh, if my friends in Nepal would see that house, they would, they would think I had completely taken leave of my senses. Why would anybody need such a grand house, they would wonder. How come there's so many bathrooms? Is there a problem? They, they would want to know. Uh, uh. <laughs> but you wouldn't think that if you saw my house. None of my friends think that when they see it. Uh, they have bigger houses than we have, many of them. Uh, and so context is everything when you're thinking about, well, what's normal here? What does somebody like me need? Uh, look, everybody knows the pattern. The income gains in the first three decades after World War II 3% a year for rich, middle, and in income and poor people alike. Very balanced growth. Ever since then, all the income gains have gone to the top. The top quintile got most of the gains. Within the top quintile, same pattern. The top 5% got most. Within the top 5%, it's the top 1%. Cut it up more finely. We've done that in some uh, arenas now. It's the top one-tenth of 1% 1 that have captured most of the gains. So what's happening? The people at the top are spending more money on everything. And I think many people make a mistake when they wag their fingers at them, shame, shame, you're buying frivolous things. They don't understand that all context is, uh, in a meaningful sense, local. Rich people travel in a different circle from non-rich people. And what's a normal size boat or, or house or, or party uh, for a rich person is just not the same as for a poor person. So I think if you are, are scolding the rich for spending on nice things, then you're making the same move as my Nepali friends would make when they say, you don't need such a big house. Uh, well, in a way, I don't, but, uh, but I do in another way. Uh, <laughs> so, so what's happening? The rich are buying bigger houses, uh, vastly bigger houses, not just marginally bigger houses, but vastly bigger ones. And the middle class isn't angry about it. You, can't, you cannot find an angry middle class voter who wants to to castigate the rich for all the fancy stuff they buy. They love pictures of it. They wouldn't, maybe they think their kids will be rich someday. They won't, but in most cases. But, <laughs> but, but the middle class isn't angry about this. Where it has an effect on the middle class is through a very indirect chain of events. The people just below the top travel in the same circles as the people at the top. And so now the people at the top, they have their daughter's wedding reception in, a, in, the, in their home. It used to be in a country club or a, a, some private facility that they'd rent. Now they have it at home. They're, they have a ballroom in their, in their home. They could do that. So people just below the top, they need to build bigger so we, they can have their daughter's wedding reception at home too. That's the custom. And people just below them, they, they, they're these overlapping social circles. Now it's dinner parties for 36 are the custom. We, our dining room won't hold 36. We need bigger. So they build bigger, and the cascade goes all the way down the income ladder. So now the median new house built in the U.S. has about 50% more square feet than its counterpart from 1970. And the median earner doesn't have any more money in real terms. So how does the median earner buy the median house? Uh, and why should he buy the median house if it's so much bigger and more expensive? If he doesn't buy the median house, his kids are going to go to a bad school. That's why he needs to buy it. Other people are buying bigger, I got to buy bigger too, therefore. So country, in counties, we have county data on this. Some counties have rapid inequality growth, others not so much. 
Where the inequality grew the most in counties, we saw the biggest increases in symptoms of financial distress. The marriage counselors say always the couples who come to see, see them list among their problems financial difficulties. It's almost never that they talk to a couple who's not in some financial bind. So the divorce rates rose more in the counties where inequalities rose, measures rose more. Long commute times. Uh, another measure you can take if you can't make ends meet is to move farther from the center where land is cheaper. Uh, we were talking about that over lunch today. If you move farther from the center, that means, I'll, I'll, in many cases, an hour-long commute by car, which is a horrible thing to endure. Uh, you, don't do the, you don't endure that unless you have to endure that. Uh, the bank, bankruptcy rates went up more in the counties where inequality grew more. Uh, so long commutes, divorce rates, bankruptcy, all, all those went up. I constructed this measure, the toil index. How much must the median wage earner work each month before he earns enough to pay the rent on the median priced house in, in the area? When inequality was uh, not rising in the 50s through the 70s, 40 hours was enough to get you uh, the, the median sized house. But look how fast that started rising once inequality started rising. It's now over 100 hours a month you have to work just to earn enough to pay the rent on the median price house. The average American wedding in 1980 cost $11,000. Now it costs $30,000. No one thinks that the people getting married today are happier because they're spending more. Why are they spending more? Because there's been an expenditure cascade on weddings. The millionaires are, are spending, or the billionaires are spending millions on weddings. Uh, and 16-year-old par birthday parties for their kids. The people in the suburbs, in the middle class, now they're spending tens of thousands of dollars on those events, much more than they used to. This is waste. Uh, you'd rather not build a bigger mansion if you didn't have to, but you don't want people saying, well, his company must have fallen on hard times. Uh, why, why is he living in such a, a small 40,000 square foot house? Uh, and so people keep pace because it's expected they, that, they, but if they could all scale back, that, if, if the answer to the question were in this envelope, I'd bet my entire re retirement account that it would say the rich would be happier if their mansions were smaller by 10%. You don't need as much of a staff. There aren't as many people stealing things from you. There aren't, aren't so many people to train and worry about writing books about you uh, when, they, when they leave your employ. Uh, why do they need such big ones? Because other people have big ones. And when everybody builds bigger, it's just like we all stood up to see better. Nobody saw any better than before. Pure waste, pure shrinkage of economic surplus. A lot of dollars spent on those things, no gain in true value for, that people experience. There are lots of things we could spend that money on that would deliver value. I'll say more in a minute. Uh, we could steer these same dollars in a very different direction with a one-line change in the tax system. Uh, I've called for, for a long time now for uh, us to abandon the income tax, the progressive income tax, and in its place adopt a progressive consumption tax. You report your income to the tax authorities just like you do now, then you report how much you save this year. Uh, we do that in the U.S. for retirement uh, accounts uh, already, so we know how to do that. You'd have to take it in account of loans paid off and loans taken out and, and really make sure you had net savings for the year. But your income minus your annual savings, that's how much you spent during the year. And then subtract from that a big standard deduction. I'm going to say $30,000 for a family of four. And people would pay tax on their taxable consumption, that amount. And the rates would start out very low. Here's the Jones family. Their income's 50000 They save 5000 of it. The deduction is 30000 so their taxable consumption is just 15000 The tax rate is 20%, so they pay less than they would pay now under the current U.S. federal income tax. But then once taxable consumption rises beyond a certain point, the rates on the next dollar keep going up. And unlike the income tax, we don't need to be shy about having them go up to really high levels. If you tax 100% of someone's income at the margin, he'll say, what, what am I stupid? I'm supposed to work when you're going to take all the extra income I earn? No. But if you say the next dollar you spend, we're going to tax by a dollar, that doesn't change things that dramatically. If you earn $2, you can still spend an extra dollar. So uh, what we know is that the rich respond to price incentives just like anyone else, even when they don't have to. 
in Manhattan, there are many billionaires. Many of them could live in the whole building if they wanted to. They could buy 30 stories and, and gut the whole thing and make one big, huge uh, living space. They don't do that. Why don't they do that? Because real estate prices in New York are so expensive that the scale of living space that's considered normal in New York is much, much smaller than in many other cities. So a billionaire in New York will live in much smaller living space than a billionaire in Dallas or a billionaire in Seattle or some other uh, city where the real estate. So the rich will respond to this incentive and they'll build smaller additions to their mansions than they were planning to. Let's say they were planning to build a $2 million addition onto their mansion. Oh, call the architect. They're going to tax me 100% on that. It'll cost us $4 million. Uh, have them scale it back. So we build a $1 million addition. And here's the fiscal magic in my proposal. We all build $1 million additions rather than $2 million additions. The tax brings it up to $2 million, so we're spending the same as before. Since it's relative addition size that matters beyond some point, we're no less happier than before. I think more happy because of the lower hassle factor. And the government gets all that revenue that it can use to, to provide other aspects of our experience that would be valuable to us in a way that building a bigger mansion across the board is not valuable to us. So let's imagine two parallel universes, and I'll, I'll quit with, with this. In one, we have the, the U.S. system with low marginal income tax rates. In that system, people buy the most expensive car on the market. I'm not going to say the most, but one. so let's suppose that's the Ferrari F12 Berlinetta, $333,000. If we had a progressive consumption tax, I'm going to just for purposes of discussion say that these same people would say, oh, government's really hammering me. I'm going to buy the Porsche 911 Turbo. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll endure that hardship uh, to escape the, the consumption tax. Well, here's the thing. Once you've spent $150,000 on a car, it has all the engineering and design features that affect performance significantly built into it already. To get any more than that, it's really expensive. We're talking uh, diminishing returns with a vengeance here. If the Ferrari is better, it's not that much better. It's a tiny little bit better. And so, uh, yes, the rich would spend less. The government would get a big bundle of tax revenue, so there'd be 100% tax on the $150,000. The rich, in, under the income tax system, pay nothing extra in tax when they buy the $330,000 Berlinetta. And because the government has no money, uh, because we're slashing government expenditure at every direction, we now have in the U.S. a $3.6 trillion infrastructure backlog. Roads collapsing, bridges collapsing, schools with leaking roofs. So here's the, here's the thought experiment that I'll, I'll leave you with. Who's happier? The person in the income tax system who <laughs> buys the $300,000 Ferrari and drives it on roads like these, uh, I do not exaggerate. I had to Photoshop this, this image, but uh, if I actually had a camera and waited by the Merritt Parkway leaving New York, you, you, you'd see Ferraris driving on roads worse than this one. So who's happier, that guy or the guy who's driving his Porsche 911 Turbo on a nicely maintained road? Somebody send me a detailed explanation for why you think the first guy would be happier. Uh, that's a completely indefensible proposition. You're, you would lose a debate in front of even an ill-informed audience uh, on, on, that, on that subject. Uh, so again, there's nothing strange here. Context matters. The lines look different. Houses get evaluated differently because of the context. And when context matters, the, the areas where it matters the most, you see spending arms races. We all stand up to see better. We don't see any of us better than before. And that's wasteful. That reduces total economic surplus. The tax system could counteract that waste without uh, requiring any new rules or regulations. It wouldn't say you can't buy rugs if you like rugs, and, you know, you buy what you want, you just pay the tax. That's the least intrusive way to solve a collective action problem. So I talk about all these issues at some length in my most recent book, The Darwin Economy. I'm going to sneak some of them in in my next book, Success and Luck, uh, just because 
Uh, nobody seems to pay any attention to me uh, when I make recommendations about what to do. I don't know, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not making as much sense as I imagine that I am. And so that's the reason I, that could be. I, I'll have to entertain that possibility. But maybe, maybe the time's not right. I, I published my first article about the progressive consumption tax in 1997. A week later, I got a thick envelope with Milton Friedman's return address on it. Oh, boy, you know, what's this going to be? Milton Friedman, for those of you who don't know, know who he, he was the patron saint of small government conservatism around the world, really, but especially in the U.S. So he, he writes and said, I very much enjoyed your economic journal article. I don't agree with you that the government should be raising more revenue right now. This was in the end of the Clinton second term when the government budget was edging toward surplus. So, all right, fair point. He didn't agree. But he said, if the government needed no, more revenue, the best way of raising it by far would be the progressive consumption tax. And he sent, the reason it was a thick envelope was it had a reprint of his 1943 American Economic Review article in which he had advocated the progressive consumption tax as the best way to pay for World War II. The government needed money then. Uh, it needs money now again. I think 97, you could argue whether the government needs money. Nobody who knows the numbers thinks we can balance budgets going forward without more revenue. There's tens of millions of people going to retire in the next few years. We need more revenue. And by the time we have a Congress that would be willing to seriously think about passing legislation to solve some of these problems, we don't have such a Congress at the moment, but by the time we have such a Congress, this will be one of the, the top proposals in the stack. The American Enterprise uh, Institute, uh, which is a very conservative think tank in the US, uh, published a book last year. Two of their senior economists advocated the progressive consumption tax. I spoke to a, uh, an audience. Uh, one woman asked me, aren't you a little worried about your proposal in light of who these other people who are supporting it? I said, well, no, I think this occasionally there are things you can do that make the pie so much bigger that you can easily figure out ways to cut it up and make everybody's slice bigger than before. And in that case, you shouldn't have to be a political genius to sell the idea to the public. I'm going to give you a bigger slice of pie. What that means is you can do more of what you want to do. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to just say, Here, here's, here's your pie, spend it. Uh, uh, there'll be some taxes. We'll tax carbon, we'll tax congestion. But that's the way forward. I, 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 I hope I live long enough to see some of this happen. But uh, I have absolutely not a glimmer of doubt that the, the, the logic of the argument is sound. Just because it's so simple, even I can understand it. And it rests on propositions, empirically pr propositions, that I've never heard anyone question. So that's the message. Uh, again, I'm, I'm fortunate indeed to get a chance to speak to such a, a, a grand audience as this. Uh, I'm aware of being fortunate, and I'm thankful for it. Uh, and I savor the moment. So uh, if we have time for questions, I'd be glad to take some. But again, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for this uh, wonderful, lively and engaging talk. And you also uh, were very convincing. However, I see a problem. Uh, with respect to your efficiency, the efficiency part of your talk. In happiness research, built on uh, looking at uh, life satisfaction data, uh, we found that there is a systematic uh, misprediction of future utility. A systematic one, not a random one. Uh, I give you two examples which we found. The first is people systematically overestimate the future, the utility future material goods will bring you and underestimate social relationships, its utility. And secondly, something you mentioned, uh, uh, namely commuting. People 
systematically overestimate the utility of future uh, commuting. So my question is, what do you do with this in your way of thinking? Uh, I'm relieved to hear your question because you started off by saying you thought you spotted a problem in the argument. And what, you, what I, I he heard you say reinforces the argument in two ways. So if, if we don't need to work as many hours to build as expensive a house as before, then we have more time to devote to social relationships. Those aren't taxed. Uh, the spending on material goods is taxed. And really, the big change in spending on material goods for most people comes not because they face a high tax on their own spending, but because those at the top were given an incentive to have that first step in the expenditure cascade be a less dramatic one. So, the people in the middle, even if they pay no extra tax, don't need to build as big a house because the people just above them won't have built such a big one, and so on all the way up. So uh, on commuting, it's, it's the same thing. What we found was that the inequality counties, the counties where inequality grew the most, when you say people underestimate the utility of commuting, I, I wasn't quite sure what you meant by that. I, I think I think... From what I know, what you must have meant was they don't realize it's going to be as bad as it turns out to be. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Uh, there's some things you get used to and they don't, they don't bother you anymore. Other things get worse over time and commuting seems to be one in that second category. So, so there's some jerk in your office, he annoys you uh, and it takes you a week uh, before you get annoyed when you first meet him. Then all you have to do is see him coming. Uh, after, after a while, and you're immediately annoyed uh, at the thought of interacting with this person. So commuting is like that second thing. It, just the thought of having to get on the road to do that is. And if people aren't so strapped for cash, having such a hard time paying their bills, they don't have to move so far from the center in order to be able to make their f finances balance. They don't have to drive so far, far in. And if we had more revenue, we could build more. Uh, tram systems and bus systems and subway systems. So I think I, think, uh, I heard you spot uh, some, some strong points in the argument, uh, but everybody likes to spin things in the most positive possible way, so maybe I'm, I'm sort of being naively optimistic in my interpretation of your question. Send, send me a note if you disagree. <laughs> so Joachim? Journal space and it's called jobs at good universities. Yes. And all of us spend untold numbers of hours trying to get that extra robustness check working, pleasing an editor, and so on. Now, if we could all find a secret handshake that said, you know what, I'll do 15 robustness checks, but not 50. I will write an 80 page submission, but not a 120 page submission to your journal. Yeah. And I will come up for tenure with three publications and not 15. We would still have the same relative ordering of who gets the good jobs and who gets into the good journals. But we don't do that. We don't tell Picasso to stop painting. We don't tell uh, Mr. Kahneman and Ernst Fair to write fewer articles that go to science. Um, because we think that it's part of human nature that we try to do the best we can. Yeah. And yes, it has a zero sum consequence. But what you describe, I think, is part of a much broader pattern of how we interact as human beings as we strive to show what we can do. Yeah, great question. In, in scientific research, often there are positive externalities from the extra papers. And so, so in general, a tournament produces a lot of extra effort. In, in many tournaments, that effort is just self-canceling. Well, in all, it's self-canceling. There's only one prize. Then we each invest in performance enhancement. You know, those efforts are collectively of no value. But if they, if they make the output we produce for society vastly more valuable, then it might be good to have a tournament. You could think of the Nobel Prize as being maybe defensible uh, in those terms. It makes many people unhappy who don't get it, but it makes many people work harder, uh, presumably, and so the, the benefit of the extra research may outweigh the, the hurt feelings of the people who don't get one. Other I think, uh, let me just, Add to that, I think 
economists and others do write too many papers. That uh, so, so much now in promotion decisions, it's a case of bean counting. Uh, where are the papers in the A journals, people want to know. Where, how many papers does he have? When I'm asked to do a tenure review, this is only partly because I'm lazy by temperament, but I write back and I say, if you will ask the candidate to identify his best paper for me and send me that, then I will read it and give you my opinion of it. And I, I think my expectation when I started doing that was that they would say, well, thanks, but we need more than that. But every single time, they have accepted my offer to read one paper. And when a candidate sends me one paper, if it's not really, really good, uh, that I'm assuming the other papers are worse, uh, I don't care how many others there are. Don't promote this guy. But if it's really, really good, how many people have written a really, really good paper? You know, there, you can count the number on your hands and toes, certainly, in most fields. Uh, and so I think NSF now is, is limiting the number of publications you can put on your grant application. So I, I think there are some things we could do that would make life better for people. You know, this, this is the assistant professor's dilemma. You gotta keep churning out extra papers. Dick Thaler once told me about a tough personnel case. What his Vita lacked was another five bad papers. If, 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 if he'd had the papers he had plus five more bad papers, it would have sailed through. But instead, it was a, a serious discussion. Should we give this guy an offer? OK. Uh, I think we are all satisfied. Thank you very much for your presentation. OK, thank you.